Hello and welcome to the webinar, which I'm hosting together with the German Environmental Agency, in which we will discuss their study on resource efficient pathways toward greenhouse gas neutrality rescue. Uh, with me together are Dr. Harry Lehmann and Dr. Jürgen Landgrebe from the German Federal Environmental Agency. They will present the study and Mara Marte Kleiner from the German think tank Agora Energiewende and Dr. Carsten Rolle from the Federation of German Industries. And they will comment on the study and afterwards we will have a debate on it. A few small technical details in the beginning. You can pose questions. Uh, in your control panel, you can put questions in your in the chat, and you can put up your hand um, in the control panel. And later on in the debate, we will be able to um, either answer your question that you have written down, or we can even um, get you into the debate um, so that you can ask your question um, orally. So I think the discussion we have today is very timely. It is um, an essential study and that helps us to understand where we are and what our choices are. And I think in this time of um, spending a lot of a lot amount of money on the European level and also in member states level, it's important to understand which way to go. Um, the study shows that we have to assess the climate and the biodiversity crisis together. It focuses on resource efficiency as a central enabler to reduce the pressure on our ecosystems and to make it easier for the industry to fully decarbonize. The European Parliament, we in the Environmental Committee, we are also working on this in the context of the new circular economy action plan that was proposed by the European Commission in March, and I am particularly, and we as the Greens working together in the Committee on Industry and Energy on the industrial strategy, where I'm fighting for bringing renewable energy, energy efficiency and resource efficiency into the center of the industrial strategy. I have to admit it's a little bit of an uphill battle, but um, I think it's the future. Um, also, we are discussing in the European Parliament, the European climate law. And here the direction is clear. We have to become climate neutral, um, but the question is how and how fast. And I think in this context, we have to really consider the findings of the IPCC special report on the 1.5 degrees from October 2018. And um, we have to construct the climate law that sets a 2030 CO2 reduction goal in line with this report and the 1.5 degree objective. Um, last but not least, the climate law will build a framework to make this happen and ensure that we listen to science. Hopefully, we are suggesting tools like um, a carbon budget, uh, the right to a healthy climate so that every citizen can go to court for it. Um, but these are battles that, that we, we will see um, happening in the next Few months and the next few months will be very decisive because we will decide on a lot of things like the 2030 climate target. So um, I'm looking forward to, to the study and the meeting and I will give the word now to Harry Lehmann and Jürgen Landgrebe from the German Environmental Agency. Just a short introduction, Dr. Harry Lehmann is the head of the Department Environmental Planning and Sustainable Strategies at the German Environmental Agency and he has had a de the department since 2004. And before he had at the Institute for Sustainable Solution and worked at the Wuppertal Institute at the CERN in Geneva and at Greenpeace International. Dr. Jürgen Landgrebe has been the head of the department on climate protection, energy and the German em emissions trading authority at the German Federal Environmental Agency since July 2019. He holds a doctorate in environmental and process engineering and before he worked um, in the federal, before he started working at the Federal Environmental Agency in 1992, he gave was a lecturer at the Technical University of Applied Science in Berlin. Looking forward to your presentation, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for introducing. We are starting with the the presentation, and we will 
uh, divide uh, the transparencies between us both. Um, I start with the motivation why does uh, the, um, the environmental agency work on that? What is the background and the idea of the rescue scenarios? What are the main results in climate protection? What are the main results for sustainable resource use? And last but not least, the relevance for you and our recommendations on that. I think in this audience, I don't have to go very deeply into the reasons, the problems we have. It is clear that one of the global challenges we have is the raw material extraction, which is shown on this transparency. Besides that, it is also the, um, that biodiversity loss is linked to material extraction, to the way we are using our areas worldwide. So we have one of the problems, one often not that discussed problem, but this is something which we think is something we will have to solve besides the climate protection. This is boring, climate change is here, we have to do something, and that's the reason why the Federal Environmental Agency always studies, looks into the future and asks itself, what is the possible greenhouse gas neutral Germany? Well, that's the, the, the reasons and the, the, let's say, starting point for looking into the future. Rescue study. The rescue study builds up on um, some studies we have done before. We started 10 years ago looking into different 100% renewable energy supplies. Then we started making a um, study about what is a greenhouse gas neutral Germany. A greenhouse gas neutral Germany looking into all sectors and clearly what we published in 2013, the possibility of having a greenhouse gas neutral Germany was the result in 2013. And I think also this uh, was an important input for the discussion in Paris. But looking into the transformation which is necessary to have a greenhouse gas neutral Germany, we realized that it might be a problem with materials and it might be good to look into different transformation paths, for example, having more lifestyle, having less efficiency, so having several scenarios in the future. If you look on this transparency, you see that we first in the world, I think, started having combined models, clearly. Transition of energy system was checked several times, but we linked, interlinked it with a sustainable use of materials. We had to have also agriculture transition, transition of the transport sector, transition of the industry sector, and a heat transition. And this all together with infrastructure, developing housing, leisure, food, mobility, and communication. And we looked into the future having more or less seven scenarios. We named them green scenarios. And um, the whole study is named Rescue, the Source Efficient Pathways Towards Greenhouse Gas Neutrality. I think rescue is the reason um, that we have the feeling that we have to be fast in realizing, in making these scenarios real. We have a late one, green late one, which is the, the, the slower scenario towards greenhouse gas neutrality, and we have Green Supreme, which is the best one of all these six. But every one of these six, seven scenarios reaches a greenhouse gas neutrality in 2050. But the path towards 2050 is different. And the material, the results for the material um, are also different because that was something which we learned from these um, scenarios. So, Every of these scenarios reach greenhouse gas neutrality, but the ambition level of material resource efficiency and circularity is very different. Thank you very much, uh, Harry. Um, well, um, how Germany can achieve greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050 while reducing raw material demand to a minimum at the same time? Uh, we have been developing um, next slide this one thank you 
we have been uh, developing uh, six uh, green scenarios and the good message is that with all these green scenarios at uh, transformation pathways, we achieve the national targets until 2030, until 2040, and we achieve almost greenhouse neutrality in 2050. But the message is we need to take action. We need to implement much more policies and measures that we have implemented uh, by now. In all scenarios, the energy system is based entirely on renewable energy in 2050, which is used through circular coupling. <clears throat> and nuclear power and also CCS is not needed as they are considered as not sustainable and carry non-manageable environmental risks. However, <clears throat> the column indicated here, um, they represent only part of the emissions caused at the national level. They do not include international aviation, maritime transport, and LULUCF. Next slide um, grants a, um, a, a, a glance on the um, scenarios in the global context. So the, the targets of the German federal government are met, but they need more policies and measures to limit global warming well below two degrees. So only the green supreme scenario indicated here in this um, yellow line under the IPCC global 1.5 Celsius course uh, represents a nearly compatible transformation path. We need additional greenhouse gas mitigation measures, of course, not only in Germany, but beyond Germany in the European context, and of course, in the global context. That's the challenge. In detail, energy transition consists on energy efficiency measures on the supply side, as well as on the demand side. Efficient sector coupling is crucial. Increasing and continuing the expansion of renewable energy is necessary. So in Germany, in fact, that does mean, of course, the expansion of wind onshore, photovoltaics, uh, at least six gigawatts per year. Also, offshore is one of the interesting additional measures we will take on board. They are not so much reflected in this study so far. Until 2050, this translates into an increase of wind onshore by a factor of um, at least three times. Imports are needed, that's for sure. We will not fully supply electricity in all sectors with renewable electricity um, um, uh, generated in, in Germany only. Yes, raw material use. That was one of the reasons why we started connecting the different models, the different views of uh, the different also people outside the universities which collaborated with us since 2014. Raw material was to remember, if you burn um, oil, you mainly use uh, fossil fuels. Your investment, material investment in machines and other things is very low. Taking renewables as a new infrastructure, as a future, you have only a very few fuels in case of wind and in the case of photovoltaic nothing, you have materials to build up the infrastructure, the technologies. To give you a hint, today um, the weight of one kilowatt hour of wind today is something about 100 grams of material you use to build up infrastructure and the windmill itself. So that means that looking into the future, we will have to look not only into the lowering of raw material use by resource efficiency, but you also have to look into possible problems with increasing material use. The good part of the story is that looking into the future, we have a shift of the materials, this is the raw material consumption until 2050. It's going from um, biomass, metals, non-metallic minerals to fossil energy categories, going down to mainly biomass, metals and non-metallic minerals. And in the best case, the Green Supreme, we lower the material use by 70% and clearly fossil uh, energy carriers are out of the game. 
remembering that I said we might have a problem with uh, materials. Let's explain a little bit more in detail. If you look into the interaction between material needs and renewable energy, if you see this picture you have, we have today, and we have 100% renewable energy sometime, building up a system which consists completely of renewable energies will have a need of materials. And the height of the materials used is dependent on how efficient your material is. And the B, when it starts, is the moment you start introducing renewable energy. And the C, the amount of recycling is at the end of the lifetime of using your renewable energy technology. Today, wind energy and photovoltaics have a minimum lifetime of 30 years. So that means recycling is beyond our 2050 goal. We should look on that. We should look on that clearly. But mainly the, the question is, is there a problem with the necessary amount of materials we need to build up this renewable energy system worldwide? Long story, yes, there is a problem. You have the global copper demand for the renewable energy system. Assuming that others in the world follow this transition towards a greenhouse gas neutral system, follow the introduction of um, the in, uh, renewable energy, we will have a dramatically increased demand for copper and others. Please don't take these um, data uh, by value. It's only, let's say, a reaction of the system. It is a reaction of uh, different markets. It's, it's, we don't say that the copper market will triple, quadruple, or go to factor eight up. It shows that whatever um, scenario we take, we will have a problem delivering enough copper in the right time to the system. This can be lowered by being more resource efficient. This can be lowered by having substitution. This can be lowered by different technologies, but we have to be aware of it today. Instead of continuing building windmills, which have one ton of copper per megawatt hour, we have to be more resource efficient and we have to be more aware that the problem of renewable energies is not the potential or the amount, it is maybe the metals we need for that. And this is not the only, we have looked into other materials also, looking into, let's say, a fair distribution. It's not only the copper, there are more materials we need for a future system that if we distribute them fair overall, then we have to rethink our um, material needs. The good part is we can lower by 70%. The bad part is we will have a dramatic increase of material needs for the new infrastructure. Thank you. Yes, and as we have pointing out already, there are no silver bullets uh, to achieve the targets, but uh, we need a broad variety of measures uh, to meet our goals. And uh, from this side, the main message is that we need to phase out coal-based power. Uh, we need to phase out coal in all sectors, in the heat sector as well as in the industrial sector, we need to abandon coal use. And if you have heard from the news yesterday, the uh, big the coalition uh, parties of the government have agreed to um, reduce, uh, no, to abandon coal in the power sector until 38. From this slide, you see that it would be possible much earlier until 2030 in the power sector. Yeah, and um, you see that also we need uh, to phase out oil heaters uh, very uh, soon uh, as well uh, as gas-based heating systems later. Uh, this is only a selection of examples from the study, but we would like also to mention the avoidance measures in the green supreme scenario, because um, such measures, they uh, also require individual needs of society. Um, of uh, our citizen to change uh, consumer behavior and thinking. Um, uh, that's uh, true for the supply side and the demand side. So we need to increase the renovation levels and the renovation um, rate um, in the heating sector. In the transport sector, we need to phase out domestic flights that is possible in Germany very soon. 
uh, traffic avoidance. We have uh, in the industry the development of new products, low carbon products and also procedures. And last but not least, we need to uh, have a look at the agricultural sector uh, and the reduction of livestock with extreme effects on, on health also of human beings. Yeah, and last but not least, um, to achieve 1.5, we also need to include natural carbon sinks uh, that we have learned from our Green Supreme scenario. Uh, we should phase out the energetic use of cultivated biomass also later for um, biomass res residuals. Uh, we should expand the use uh, of wood for carbon storage, for furniture, uh, for an example. And last but not least, in agriculture, revetting degraded organic soils, uh, sustainable forestry, and active forest transformation. These are the main elements of the future strategy. Thank you. Yes, and the linkage to the European Green Deal of our study is uh, multilateral. So, there it is, starts with climate ambitions and it ends with just transition. It is research and innovation, clean energy, industry and circular economy, for example, switching to, um, uh, let's say, alternative fuels in air transport, building and renovation, how much and how fast have we to do it, farm to fork strategy, ecosystem and biodiversity. But um, it is also, uh, which we should remember, lifestyle. If we talk about our main outcomes of our study is that lifestyle is very um, important. How much, at what time do we consume? What is that what we define as a welfare, a wealthy, a happiness, a well-being or a well-having? So this lifestyle is something we will have to discuss in future because without lifestyle changes, uh, for example, by having less flights, we will not achieve our goals. At the end, main conclusions. Limiting global warming to 1.5 requires the reduction of natural greenhouse gas emissions by 70% until 2030. We, for us, is Green Supreme, our leading um, scenario. We have to have a rapid phase out of all fossil energy carriers. We have to uh, implement energy material efficiency and lifestyle changes. We have to, uh, we, have, we can reduce the materials but we have to look into the dynamics for the demand for in individual materials. Uh, we have to be to work together in, in with other countries. We are dependent uh, with, from other countries, uh, for example, importing uh, materials and um, greenhouse gas neutral chemicals, greenhouse gas neutral fuels. There we are dependent from other parts of the world. The transformations areas of rescue corresponds to eight out of 11 elements of the Green Deal. Yeah. And the three strategies we want to move into the future is avoidance, substitution, and natural carbon sinks, and a complete renewable energy system. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, and also to see that it's possible, but a, a lot of things have to change. Um, I think uh, some people had the problem that they could not see the full presentation um, of the slides, but uh, I guess the slides will be possibly also made available afterwards. Um, so you can check this. So now um, we have comments on uh, your study. Um, first from, from Mara Marte Kleinert. She is the head of office of the director of the German think tank Agora Energiewende. She is part of the management team and responsible for the fundamental issues of energy system transformation. And she has been with Agora Energiewende since 2014 and holds a degree in political science with a focus on quantitative methods and international political economy from the University of Mannheim, Bremen and Maastricht. So looking forward to hear your comment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, extensive introduction and um, yes, I'm very happy to be uh, invited to, to comment on this very interesting study by the um, German Environmental Agency. Um, what they have only touched briefly here is that they also uh, published a uh, policy paper that kind of touches on, upon the policy changes here. And 
I would rather like to concentrate on that as, to be honest, Agora's expertise is not necessarily raw materials, though we do know that this is a part of that. Additionally, we have um, published a um, impulse paper in the past weeks on how we could recover from the COVID-19 crisis and uh, how this should think ahead towards the Green Deal, towards climate neutrality, and so on. So um, I'm coming kind of from that angle, just to, to clarify that before. Um, and of course, we agree, agree immensely with, yes, we do need to increase the ambition when it comes to protecting the climate, when it comes to reaching climate neutrality by the second half of this century or even earlier. And um, we, of course, believe that the Green Deal is a very good step in the right direction. Um, and now coming from the current uh, COVID-19 crisis and the um, implied economic effects it will have, which are not necessarily small, but rather larger than what we've experienced, anything we've experienced before. Um, we think that um, we should definitely align whatever we do now to stimulate economies and on the other side, um, keep in mind climate neutrality. And um, therefore investing in technologies that help us now is important. And I think this is very much in line with uh, what um, Mr. Lehmann and Mr. Landgrebe just presented is we need to go into onto that path right now. It, it's very much in line with the Green Supreme, I think was the name scenario, that um, if we look at investment cycles of the industry, but also in private households, everything that is invested in right now will have a long-term effect on the climate. So when we invest in a new fridge, it will probably be there in 10 to 15 years. When we invest in a new car, it will probably be there in 20 years. When we invest into a steel furnace, for example, it will probably be there in 30 to 50 years. So whatever we do right now has a direct effect on our ability to reach climate neutrality in 2050. Hence, whatever we stimulate in the economy right now needs to have in mind the Green Deal and needs to think about what can we kind of take from the Green Deal and use it as an economic stimulus right now. And um, Keeping in mind this kind of brings us to the um, guiding principle, how we called it, um, invest now, but reinvest later. So whatever we finance right now, we should do, and then try to refinance it at a later stage. For example, in Germany, we proposed uh, reducing the power prices and then going into advance with that and trying to re finance that a couple years later with increasing CO2 prices. Um, looking at the current budget proposal, however, and this is what my European colleagues have been doing in the past weeks, um, this is not necessarily part of the current budget, this whole thinking. It's not necessarily entirely green at this point. And what it needs to be is guiding while being flexible, guiding into the green direction while being flexible at the same time. Um, I'm not sure how much time I've already used up, but I think I'm going to cut here. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you, we we look forward then to to um, your contributions later when we have the discussions. Um, and now from um, the industry side, Dr. Carsten Rolle, who has been the head of the Department on Energy and Climate Policy at the Federation of German Industries (BDE) since 2008 and has a doctorate in regional science from the University of Münster. Looking forward to your views, Mr. Rolle. Thank you very much, Mr. Bloss, dear colleagues. Um, thank you very much for having me in, in this call and commenting uh, the very interesting study of, of uh, Yuba. Uh, Mr. Lehmann uh, just presented, Mr. Landgrebe. Um, when I look at the study with the six scenarios, of course, I was um, uh, tended to, to compare it a little bit with our own work uh, two years ago, our own uh, study work and the study work of others like Dina and Akatech. We did, I think, similar exercises. I think 
in the first place, it's interesting to say what they all have in common, because um, there's, I think, a core of, of joint answers or joint results that is worth mentioning uh, in the first place. And, and one of those would be, for my thinking, uh, we will need all technologies that we could think of for this huge uh, challenge. It is just um, a huge challenge to, to meet climate neutrality by 2050, as the European Union has called for, and as we supported as German industry as a target. Um, this is just a huge challenge, so we can't really select and pick and choose, but we will need huge efficiency gains, uh, a lot of uh, fuel uh, changes uh, in, in the different fuels, uh, including hydrogen. We need more electrification, all of that together. Uh, plus, as you said, mitigation at being the biggest, um, biggest part of it. Plus, second, um, also to some extent, international cooperation, uh, which would be interesting to discuss then to what extent uh, this will be and should be part of climate neutrality whatever Article 6 of the UNFCCC uh, will bring us, but that will be also part of solution. Um, and then thirdly, as you said, is it some sort of uh, carbon storage, carbon usage or sinks? Um, so negative emission technologies, just an, an issue. I had the pleasure to, to discuss with Mr. Bloss a few days ago um, when we discussed on climate neutrality and the whole range of technologies, uh, negative emission technologies, that we would probably also need in the longer run. Um, although it might be worth, I think, mentioning that, of course, these technologies all have uh, an impact, but they're associated with different costs, obviously. I mean, carbon use and uh, carbon storage technology, from today's perspective, uh, usually are a lot cheaper than several of the um, very initial phase uh, technologies of negative emissions that we will, in the end, uh, we'll also need because because the challenge is just as basic big as it is. Second, what is what else is similar? Um, I think worth mentioning is the use of biomass um, that has to be redirected more in industry um, rather than being burnt uh, in in power plants. That was one of your findings, very similar to the findings and, and propositions we as BI made out of uh, our studies. Um, imports we will need energy imports in the longer run we will don't we don't see energy or to key uh, as something realistically to be aiming for um, and thirdly and that is probably the core of the study and the design of the study bringing together uh, climate change policy and climate change issues together with material efficiency and resource efficiency issues that is uh, worth not only thinking of but also bringing politically together because um, we also believe that circular economy and recycling does play a role also in achieving climate policy targets and that why rightly so the green deal uh, addresses both i think together it has a strong chapter in uh, circular economy being part of a broader view of climate policy and in former times when i was uh, in charge of raw materials in bdi we had a uh, close look on uh, how to increase recycling roads, especially with metals um, that we wouldn't call co consumption of metals, but more use of metals. But that's that's a detail because metals are always reused somehow. But of course, there's a lot of uh, a lot of chances associated with that because the the reuse of metals is a lot less energy intensive than the primary use of the raw materials question is what can be politically done and there is of course um, something to do also also with within the European Union with um, illegal exports of scrap metals uh, that go abroad to China and other places although we would urgently need them to, to be kept in Europe and to make use of them here that's a political um, a point we should we should address on the other scenarios uh, I think it is interesting to see what impact do different dimensions have you've also looked into lifestyle changes um, our view is yes it might have an impact the question is to what extent can that be politically called for or addressed and what does that do with the political acceptance of the whole thing uh, that's why at least uh, most of the studies I, we were looking at um, try to um, show how with technical 
uh, innovations, um, climate change can be fulfilled. Uh, of course, we, we all know quite well that uh, life ch uh, behavior changes uh, usually cause a sort of, um, well, not really uh, helpful for, for acceptance. Uh, and that's why it's a touchy issue, probably. Um, just a detail on the zero growth assumption, maybe in the studies. I saw that I think you're, you're uh, assuming um, GDP growth over the time with the zero. That is, of course, an issue for an economy and also for, for, for industries. Although you said um, you expect population to decrease, to shrink, and by that um, make that helpful that, that the GDP per head will, will maybe slightly grow. I was just wondering how that will be fulfilled in an aging society. I know that Japan has a huge issue with exactly this, uh, with uh, in a population that goes older, um, with small growth rates, and by that, with really a small speed of transformation here and, and uh, investments, that is of course something we could recall. But now, um, what what's the political dimension? I mean, if we all are quite clear on the 2050 target, on on the way we want to go, and that we need many technologies, the question is, how can we really make sure that the investments needed are done? That is, I think, the core question. Um, it's a little bit of pity that you didn't really look into the, the cost, but, but there's other studies that come up with big figures that show it is maybe possible, but it is a huge challenge. And we have to clearly set a, a set of instruments that enables everyone, every investor, private investor, corporate investors, to rightly do so. Um, to really bring in the new technologies, the more efficient technologies. That's a question of trillions of euro, uh, if you look into uh, Germany or in the EU even. And my big fear in these days is how can we really make sure that these investments are going to happen in times of an economic crisis, in times where we see GDP, GDP to be shrinking in countries like France, Italy, Spain, by ranges of 11%, as I read just these days, for the next two years to come. So we expect private investment to be shrinking and public investment probably not being in the um, position to equalize the shrinking uh, private uh, investment, at least for the next couple of years to come. And in this environment, um, we have to question, of course, what is possible in the very short and midterm and what is possible in the longer run. How does really the climate pathway up to 2050 can look like? Even with the minus 55% um, CO2 reduction target that is under discussion in the European Union in these days, with 40% at the moment, discussion is to, to increase that to 55%. Parliament would even ask for something like 65%, as in your study, I think also was one of the scenarios, 67. Um, this just means five times um, the CO2 reduction rate we've seen in the past 30 years, right? 55% uh, is increasing the speed of annual reduction times five in the next 10 years, each and every year, under the circumstances I've tried to uh, describe. And that's making me a little bit uh, skeptical, at least for the very short-term um, time phase. Where are the instruments that really help us in achieving these goals? I mean, uh, it's right that we have technologically many options already on the table, and that would subscribe. Uh, German industry and European industry is well prepared for that. But how can we make sure that the investment is done? That's the crucial question. And especially uh, if the uh, climate change, uh, the climate ambitions out of Europe um, change in these days, as we see in China and Asia, the gap between Europe and the rest of the world, the scissor opens up. And that's, I think, the, the final sentence in your summary, at least. Um, how can we make sure that the European activity is embedded in an international environment so that the investment gap does not really cause uh, competitiveness issues that, that are making us a little bit nervous. Maybe that's as a second uh, command, and then I'm happy to, to uh, respond to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
for all of those who are listening, um, you can also put up your hand and so we can uh, get you in. Um, but we have also received a lot of questions. But before we go to the questions, I would like to give uh, it back to uh, Seliman and Mr. Landgrebe um, to comment on the comments you got. And I think there's some commonalities, maybe also some uh, some differences. Uh, the, the question of CCS and CCU was also mentioned uh, in the questions. and um, you said that it's not going to be needed. Uh, it is maybe more of the idea that, that it will be important. Um, yeah, would be interesting to hear your replies. One comment about uh, gross national product growth. We only assume in the green supreme the zero growth and the others we um, have uh, still a growth. It is also very interesting that if you look into a, such a zero growth scenario, you realize building up all these um, infrastructure uh, avoids zero growth because you have a growing industry and that means later if you want to have zero growth and we put it into our basket of possibilities to have um, to looking into the different options into the future. So that's in the green supreme, in the other is not. Um, second point, investment cycles. Yes, I agree that investment cycles are very important in both. We have to invest early, but we also have to avoid lock-ins at the moment. If we go for the wrong technology, and then it will last for 30 years. And that's a problem for, uh, for example, uh, technology is based on fossil fuels. Um, resource efficiency and circularity. We, we always talk about circularity, but we also have to remember that resource efficiency is also part of the whole basket. That is, we have to make it smaller and that what is smaller more circular so that's important because if you look at renewable energy technologies they will stay for 30 years so for the next 30 years um, the recyclability of wind plants are not that impacting the copper market so we have to talk now how we redesign and remanufacture how are the rules for all these technologies and last point lifestyle yes but uh, oftenly, uh, at least we have to check what are the impacts of lifestyle. And at the moment, if we sit together and talk about uh, this conference, which would have done um, in Brussels if there would not have been Corona, then we will see that there is a lifestyle change. If we talk with people from air transport, from hotels and that, they assume that the amount of flights will never be back on that what was before Corona, at least if you look at business flights and other things. So we have lifestyle changes. Um, clearly, I didn't want to manage that in that way, but we have to be aware that it is possible to change lifestyle. Yeah, thank you, Ari. In addition, I would like to mention that in all scenarios, uh, Germany continues to embed it in the EU and in the global trade and uh, has a modern and uh, uh, efficient technology and industry. So it, it's not a study about decarbonization uh, of, of industry, only uh, or uh, deindustrialization. So we um, really are um, very sure that with these scenarios, we also um, focus on qualitative, qualitative um, uh, growth uh, uh, in terms of societal um, changes. Yeah, um, the second comment I would like to make, uh, and thank you for that, that um, the lessons uh, from the green late scenario um, we learned in contrast to the um, green supreme is that rapid action is not only possible, but also cost effective. So we have learned that it's really much better uh, to invest as um, uh, our colleague from Agora mentioned now uh, in the investment cycles that we already have already in this decade and not to, to shift um, technology uh, changes in the future. And the third comment I would like to make on CCU, this was not considered in the study. We have been um, taking out CCS because there is also no uh, public uh, acceptance in Germany for this technology. and. Uh, if you look at other member states, uh, there is only one very uh, small project in Norway and uh, we do not really see the option uh, for Germany very soon um, to realize CCS um, also in terms of uh, um, carbon costs. But CCU already happens in Germany. 
in small uh, scales in the uh, chemical industry. And there are maybe some um, options for use, but it's not the solution for decarbonization. Uh, it is mainly one very small element and um, also um, not very much um, uh, employed so far in Germany. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe you could just uh, comment a little bit because there was now many questions um, on um, hydrogen. Um, what are your perspective on the hydrogen plants from the German government? How do you see the hydrogen strategy? Um, how do you see the need to import energy, uh, green hydrogen, um, and what would it mean for, um, or, or how do you balance it uh, with uh, renewable energies and uh, the mass expansion of renewable energies? So. Maybe this is something that uh, we have three questions on now, so you could elaborate a little bit. On, because it's also, I have to say, a very hot topic here on the European level. In the next week, on the 8th, um, we will have the European hydrogen strategy being published, and the question of CCS for the next 10 years at least is, uh, is addressed there. And it seems that um, there is the idea that we would go and take a lot of blue hydrogen for the time being in the strategy. If we talk about hydrogen strategy, then we talk about a power to X strategy because you use power electricity for different uh, demands. Um, the easiest way is uh, power to electricity means that you use electricity for mobility or for whatever, or power to heat, uh, heating and cooling houses, or power to chemicals. And that's where the hydrogen comes in because you Hydrogen is the carrier for the renewable energies in time and in room. That means that hydrogen is for itself not, um, let's say, important. Important is where can I use the hydrogen? So there are, we are thinking that there are three areas where we have to have fast use of hydrogen for um, fuels. One is air transport by power to liquid sustainable aviation fuels. Another one is the steel industry, which needs the hydrogen for the, the chemical products. And we think also that the chemical industry has to have hydrogen for their internal process, but on the long term also for having uh, imports of glycerin um, for producing the chemicals. So hydrogen is a part of a complete cross sectoral coupling. If you look at the studies, which other, they always talk about cross sectoral study. And today it is called hydrogen strategy. But we have to remember that the real reason is that we want to connect the different cross sectoral, cross sectoral sector, no, coupling the different sectors so that the, you have an exchange of energy. And what is also important is you have a storage system which um, allows also to transport the energy from other parts of the world to, to uh, Europe. And that comes to imports. We have looked into the necessary imports from today until 2050. They are different, clearly, depending on the scenario. But more or less in 2050, we have as much of imports in energy than we have producing inside uh, in Germany with electricity and that. That what we are importing is mainly fuels, fossil not fossil fuels, we have power to liquids, which we use for ships and air transport, we have power to chemicals, and we have others. And that's important. Without Germany, without importing from other parts of the world, we will not achieve the greenhouse gas neutrality. And then you can play around. It's, uh, take uh, imports from Africa or from Brasilia, take imports from other countries in Germany, you can have imports from um, other parts of uh, Europe, Norway, etc. So it's, there are enough areas around in the world where we can buy this import. But important is that this is based on renewable energies, on new renewable energies, and it is not blue gas. It means we really have to go for a green hydrogen, and what the other colors are dangerous. I said lock in effects. If we put a lot of money into let's say not green hydrogen, then we will have a lock-in effect, which will lead to 
possible political problems in 10, 15 years if we explain, let's say, blue hydrogen importers that that was not a greenhouse gas neutral pass. Okay. If I may may add and and maybe just uh, command on on how Lehmann said, yes, it is power to X. Uh, so hydrogen and all the derivatives uh, that we are talking about. Um, just to make the, the sheer size we are talking about uh, quite obvious in Germany, I think 20% of the energy consumed is electricity, 80% is molecules, whatever, gas, oil, coal. So at the moment, just greening the electricity sector is by far too too small. Um, and we have to, to deal with these 80% of molecules. Uh, and even if the whole bunk by efficiency should shrink, and even if some parts could be electrified, there will remain a big bust of molecules that have to be green one way or another, and hydrogen or power to X is, of course, a large part of the answer. And that's why the importance of this issue going forward to climate neutrality has risen so uh, so strongly in the past two or three years. Um, uh, and that's why we also are very hopeful uh, and very engaged in this issue uh, next week with the uh, hydrogen strategy of the European Commission. And uh, this is really an international issue. It's nothing Germany alone can deal with. We're talking about building up global markets, otherwise it will fail. Just one sentence on the investment cycles, if I may, because this is, I think, a very important point. Um, yes, I, I fully agree. Um, to make the whole investment doable and as cost efficient as possible, it is very wise to do it within the investment cycle. So whenever a new investment is occurring, then offering all the help to get the more um, climate friendly um, technology, even if it is more expensive, and not to um, well devaluate it that exists uh, the existing uh, investments. So thinking in investment cycles is important. And speaking for the steel industry, that has of course big reinvestment, uh, reinvestments in the next five to 10 years to do, for instance, in Germany, uh, it is important to make sure that they will really reinvest in well, the next melter technology that might run on, on hydrogen. Otherwise, they will invest somewhere out of Europe uh, in old technologies. And that's why the two issues are strongly linked together. Uh, yeah, Frau Kleiner, you also wanted to come in on that. And maybe also you can comment um, on what is currently on the table in in term in the on the European level, uh, on the German level, uh, where the investment packages in on the European level, uh, we saw that there was an idea to invest, for instance, in the um, renovation wave, but now it's really left to the member states. Um, so yeah, maybe you can come in on the hydrogen question, but then also on what what we need to see now in this uh, investment programs. I'll try to link it to some extent, at least. Um, on hydrogen, I think what we are kind of, we're a little in danger to discuss this whole hydrogen only linked to green hydrogen and say, we have to have green hydrogen tomorrow to some extent. I think looking at it from 2050 and then backwards, saying we yes we, we do need a full green hydrogen world that uh, requires us to think about how can we phase in the use of hydrogen where if it's not used yet and how can we get the infrastructure to have that amount of green hydrogen that we will have to have in 2050 and that kind of brings us a little back to not only think about green hydrogen, the, the pure version of green hydrogen, but also about if a steel plant wants to invest in a hydrogen plant or a, a DRI plant now, it will probably not be entirely fed by green hydrogen, but it will probably, but rather maybe a little blue, maybe a little fossil, maybe a little whatever. I think that the you know the hydrogen world seems to be very colorful to me, um, and getting that infrastructure phased in requires us to think a little further than only green hydrogen here. Um, but yes, in the end, it, we have to talk about green hydrogen, full stop, whenever that may be. 
And I think uh, it, we're not the only ones phasing in our hydrogen thinking. Right now, there are lots of institutions and organizations thinking about hydrogen at the moment, especially with uh, next week's um, European Green Lives hydrogen strategy coming up with the hydrogen strategy in Germany. So um, I think it's going to be a, a colorful debate in the next weeks, months, even years. Um, but at this point, saying we have to have green hydrogen and nothing else, I, th I think is not really bringing us on the right path, but rather locking us in, in well, it's green hydrogen or nothing. And that's, I think that work didn't really work well before, of course, in the energy transition issues. Um, on investments and uh, what's on the table regarding that. Um, I would say um, what we see in the current, I'm kind of broadening this from hydrogen to, because you always also talked about renovation, but, um, I think we were surprised how many climate elements we saw in the German economic stimulus package, um, with hydrogen being way more present than we expected it to be. Um, and also that part being rather green to some of our, some of our surprise. Um, and also um, how uh, the German government thought about the car industry was quite surprising to us. We were also surprised that the reduction of the power price was in there. However, what we are kind of missing is thinking climate as the cross-sectoral, cross-measure, baseline we have to keep in mind it, it kind of the, the economic stimulus package in germany had climate elements but climate was not really the baseline and this is what we would rather expect that climate becomes the baseline whatever sector we look at how is that climate relevant right now how will it be climate relevant in 5 10 or even 30 50 years and um, getting that thinking into whoever writes policies, whoever discusses them, still seems to be rather a battle, sometimes rather not to a battle. Um, and I think it's similar, and I'm rather concentrating on, on national politics, but my, what my European colleagues tell me about the European budget proposal, for example, it seems similar. It's always one element, but it's not the, the baseline that goes across all, all policy fields, all sectors, Whatever we do, is it climate relevant? Do we have to have an impact assessment that's really just a climate impact assessment, maybe? Um, so getting that thinking into politics would definitely help then getting the policy frameworks, for example, investing in the hydrogen steel plant, for example. Um, because of course, if I were a steel company in Europe or Germany, I wouldn't invest in it if the, I don't have the policy framework that allows me to invest top dollar here. And then even when it's more, more expensive than the current technology, and then in the long run, be there stuck with my stranded asset. Um, I could, my green heart wouldn't kind of compete with my uh, mm -hmm. commercial heart there. We have to uh, we have to uh, stop soon the debate. Unfortunately, I think we could have uh, at least taken half, uh, half an hour longer or more. Um, the, the unfortunate situation of the moderator is that I cannot comment so much on these things, even though I would have loved to. Um, I just let me to say two sentences first. Unfortunately, most of the debates I mean they turn into hydrogen debates. I think we should discuss much more about renewable energies and how do we expand renewable energies because that's apparently the uh, precondition uh, for having a lot of hydrogen in, two ten, in 2050. Second, I would, be, I would have been very interested to hear also from um, uh, Mr. Rolle about the, um, the goals because on the one hand, um, I hear from the business community a lot that you need, we need, a, they need a direction like where to go where is um, where should you invest? So how can private and public money align to really get somewhere? And I think the the like very ambitious 2030 target would give this direction. And but then sometimes also I hear pushbacks from industry saying, oh, we don't uh, disclose this. So there's a little bit of a contradiction sometimes in between. 
but I have to close it now. But I wanted to give the last word to uh, Mr. Lehmann and Mr. Landgrebe, who have uh, produced this wonderful study. And maybe just um, the two uh, most important um, yeah, actions to do now in order to, uh, to achieve uh, the scenarios and best the leadership scenarios that you were proposing. Um, I personally can say that one of the most important things for me is that I take up what we have learned now during Corona with traveling video and all these things because I think that will have an impact in a real impact on greenhouse gases and that we will have to find a solution for example then for the aviation industry how they can survive but let's take this lifestyle change and propose, propose it into the future that's probably for me personally. Yeah, and additionally, I would like to mention that now there is a lot of money around um, for investment. Um, COVID-19 green packages are available. We have the innovation fund of the European ETS. So there are options for radical innovation very soon. And time is very scarce. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all of you very much for this really interesting debate. Uh, Mr. Lehmann, Mr. Landgrebe. Uh, Mr. Rolle and Mrs. Kleiner, um, and I think the UBA, the German Federal Agency for, Envi for the Environment, and uh, for making it happen. And um, I think there's still a lot of questions uh, unanswered also in the chat, and I'm sorry uh, to all of the listeners that we couldn't uh, answer them now. If you want, you can send them to us, uh, and we will try to answer them then in, in writing. Um, and yeah, the, the recording of this webinar will also be made available online. So thanks for, to everyone who listened in. Uh, thanks for you who participated. And um, yeah, this is a, a long way to go, 30 years, but good that we have the scenarios. And now it's just a question of making it happen and mobilizing the political will. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Just, you know.